Ili. Hello and oh. welcome to AIL TV. Um, this evening we have got a very interesting program. And of course, as you guys know, this is the very end of Black History Month. Now, Sonia Kamara from For You Two News Magazine has got a guest here. They're gonna be, they are going to be discussing very, very interesting things. My favorite, which is business. Is that right, Sonia? That's definitely business, Joseph. Thank you so much. Good, 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 good. Now, I don't want to waste much of your time here. Let me hand you over to Sonia Kamara, who will be telling you everything that you need to know about business. Sonia Kamara, you are on. Thank you so much, Joseph. Well, I don't know if I'm telling you everything you know about business, because I think a lot of us know more than we actually give ourselves credit for. But today, it's the last day of Black History Month, and for you two, TV show, we have got together a show called In the Black, because when your bank account is in the black, you have funds, you have money. And I'm so pleased to have Rudy Page with me, a multiple entrepreneur, a community activist. When I say activist around business, worked with Dyke and Dryden as their sales and marketing uh, gentleman for oh, many years. And we are going to talk about recognition for black business, how black business works. And when we think about Black Lives Matter and the Black Pound, what does that really mean to the black community? We're going to look at that. We're going to really start drilling down some economics. And you can join us live. Facebook Live using AIL TV. Just tap in AIL TV Facebook Lives and you can get hold of us and give us some comments. But first of all, let me introduce my guest, Mr. Rudy Page. Thank you so much for joining us, Rudy. So, how are you? I, I'm well, Sonia, and it's great to be on your show. And I, in one sense, I'm pleased that this is the last show for Black History Month as it relates to, we've been on so many Zooms and lots of publicity this month. My business partner, uh, Derek Clement, was on the Channel 4 programme, Hair Power. So he was able to give the um, recognition to Winston Isaacs, the Splinters, and we're, we know that we've come to recognition in terms of the contribution that particularly the Windrush generation and their children have made to the economic life of this country. And then, of course, we're here to the, tonight in particular to talk about Dyke and Dryden, given that we're in North London, really. We are in North London. And I always love when Joseph shows that clip of West Green Road, because yeah. as we know, Dyke and Dryden, the business was situated on yeah. West Green Road. Yeah. When you think of West Green Road, we can think of yeah. so many black businesses uh, that okay. were there. You know, not, not only Dyke and Dryden, we had Head Start yeah. bookshops. Most people don't actually know the West Indian world had a stint where it was based on West Green Road as well. Absolutely. Right you... opposite Head Start. And I can tell you a story later that brings in both those businesses as it relates to Dyke and Dryden and my journey, you know, through the ages. Okay, so now you've said the right thing. In fact, let's take me on the Dyke and Dryden business journey. Okay, because okay. we all, not only were they entrepreneurs, but we have to give credit where credit's due. They're individuals who came during the, we could actually class them as Windrush. They build a business, a black business. They collaborated because you had three men at the head of the business. So that talks yeah. about cooperation, collaboration. And they went on to do some more than run a business. They were actually supporting other businesses with their products. But let me hear your story. In fact, right. how did you get driving job i've always wanted to ask you that <laughs> employed. exactly great start so first of all mr dyke and mr dryden started in 1965 
at uh, 43A uh, West Green Road and Mr. J Mr. Wade joined them in 1968. And so they, they they in fact started selling records before they moved into cosmetics, where they moved to 126A West Green Road. And that was uh, Mrs. Robinson who really drove that. But um, my, my uh, entrance to the Dyke and Dryden story, I arrived in 1981. So in fact, I had actually been introduced to Dyke and Dryden uh, by um, Arif Ali. Because uh, for a couple of years That's before, like, yeah. yeah, when he was at um, Caribbean Times in Font Hill Road, Frinsbury Park. And because uh, I'd been working for an advertising and marketing company, and uh, he told me about Dyke and Dryden. So I went along to, you know, to, to see what services our company could provide, provide them. And that's when I really got to know Mr. Wade, first of all, and then and then in 1981, I had finished a, a small contract for them. And Mr. Mr. Wade said that there was a potential of uh, a role there because one of the large men, uh, one of the large manufacturing companies, black manufacturing companies from the States called m, &M Products Atlanta were looking for a salesperson. And, I, and he said, would I be interested? And I said, yeah, I would be very interested because by then I'd started to realize what Dyke and Dryden was as a black business. So you're now talking about me being around 21, 22 years old. And um, so to actually come into a black business with a large warehouse, that, that was at St. Louis Road off Seven Sisters Road in Tottenham. It was a great opportunity. And then once I was brought into the firm, then I never looked back in terms of the okay. pride of, of being in a black business that was an integral part of what was going on, you know, at well, the time. Well, this is really interesting because you've highlighted something to me, which is really important, that an organization back in the 60s and 70s recognized that you needed sales and marketing. A lot of businesses yeah. don't really give enough credit to that role in the business. So, you and, know, the fact they recognized that was a necessity yeah. to grow their business I think yeah, that's such a great point, Sonia. I'll tell you why, because we're now talking about the 1980s, early 80s. And remember, black guys could be get could get arrested and did get arrested during lunchtime, even in their suit and tie because of the sus laws. So we always have to remember the context. So the context in the 80s of Dyke and Dryden and the success they had, you're talking quite a brutal time in terms of social, cultural economic when it when it came when it came to people of the windrush generation and their children and much of that kind of history it has you know is forgotten and not recognized by people but for those of us who came up in that generation so um their their so their appointment of myself at the time so i was really the first sales and marketing person based here in the uk professionally and there was, a, there was one or two in terms of uh, America. Uh, there was one other uh, lady who, who was actually before me, but didn't really work here so much. And that was Nancy and who Ash. Was that? Nancy Ash. And that's, Nancy worked for Summit Products, but she, she was more international than, you know, up and down the high streets the way I was with Dyke and Dryden. So, so that role I played in terms of sales and marketing then encouraged the other companies to take on uh, youngsters uh, to, to, to be involved in selling and marketing and competing. And then, of course, we had our homegrown businesses like Mr. Bruce from Edmonton, and, and he had three or four sales. Oh, Mr. The Bruce. So, so let me just go back there. So Summit, was that a black business owned business as well? No, no not at the time, but they had a black uh, CEO who later became a partner. I think he may have been a partner in there already. And uh, I'm, and trying to think of his name. I'm trying to think of his name. I can see his face. Oh, okay. I just wondered. Okay. That's the, this, I hope it's nice he's to have some background. I hope he's not watching. He'd be upset that I can't remember his name, but it'll come to me at some point because he, he was a good okay, guy so, uh, based in Chicago. Okay. So we've got Summit there. And then we, like you said, you've got, see. Um, then you also, had Bruce. 
Bruce, yeah, also um, being representing these organisations. But really, I want to ask you, what about the hair industry? Obviously, we know it is a billion dollar industry right now, yeah. which is predominantly yeah. run by um, a lot of Asian um, individuals, the shops as, as mm. such, the factoring. But talk to me about the innovation, you know, that mm. really got Dyke and Dryden, and we know they did records prior, to really get them going as businessmen? I think what really did it in terms of um, market power and playing that pivotal role in the 1980s is when the curly perm and the relaxers, particularly the curly, cur curly perm and your hairsprays in terms of moisturizers, moisturizers, and that was working with uh, particularly m and products and soft sheen products, TCB, those brands. So it's really the 1980s where they came to the forefront. So up until then, th there were other wholesalers that were ahead of Dyke and Dryden as such. But th that, so it's that early 80s time which brought them that dominance over the next 10 to 15 years. So yeah, so it's definitely the, cur the curly perm. And then at the same time, there was a growth in salons as well, and retailers and wholesalers. Black from salons. Our... Yes, yes. So, and hairdressing schools as well. So you had a lot of entrepreneurs, literally thousands of entrepreneurs from our community, that, that generation, which had a blend of the Windrush generation and the children of the Windrush generation, all running, all running their businesses. And there was a, a cultural pride also in, as it related to the community as well, because again, you had this new generation wanting to, to showcase themselves. All the fashion shows used to talk about dress to impress. And so there was a strong cultural self-esteem and confidence despite the difficult environment. And then of course, in the eighties, a lot more of us started to travel internationally. As I said, we we're going to Atlanta, Chicago, Dallas, New York, people like myself and others, you know, so we, we started to get that exposure. And then as that was happening, then more of the companies, and, and this always happens when the market's competitive. So more of the black American companies and some of the other wider mainstream companies that had black brands, then the, it was fierce competition because London was a European hub. So in those days, you didn't have a lot of transshipment direct from the US market into Africa or even into Europe. Everybody came to London. This was the place. So the Nigerians, the Ghanaian business people, a lot of women as well uh, would come to London, come to Dyke and Dryden. The people from Europe, from Holland in particular, would, and France, they would come to Dyke and Dryden. Or of course, they go to Brixton, place their orders. And so we'd get large orders from the other wholesalers and retailers. And we had a lot of so, you know, great retailers as well, like Martins of Brixton. He was there for years. Okay. So you're talking about a network now. We're not just talking about manufacturing. We're talking about collaboration. We're talking about wholesale. We're talking about retail. And we're talking about independence. So I'm looking at that black pound actually staying within the community at one point. Because when you think yeah. about the process you've just explained, that means that the pound, as in the income, you know, we talk about how many bounces the income has in the community. What you just described means the economy, the, the money was actually staying within the community at one point. It, what, it, what do you it, think? It was. That? Yeah, because it was. Because at one time, Dyke and Dryden was the largest supplier of trade credit. To, to Caribbean businesses and the wider black businesses. So again, if you think of what that meant, so the largest mm -hmm. amount of customers, the largest amount of trade credit, so that's a considerable amount of money flowing in and around the market. And those, those same people then were the largest trainer of young people and the largest promotional work in terms of uh, 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 photographers, photo shoots, fashion Stylist. shows all the stylists, all the models, all those young people. So that, but, and then not only that, those same young people brought the brand as well.
Carry on. Sorry, carry on, Rudy. So sorry. Rudy, yeah, so I'm so sorry about so... I thought it was on silent. Yeah, carry on. Because yes. we're just talking the the the, the, so, the model. So, the so what we describe there is the ecosystem. This is the thing that uh, many people don't recognize that the contribution that was made to the economy of this country, because also what's integral to that as well then, Sonia, is that Dyke and Dryden had two of their own brands. One was called Natural Beauty, the other was Super Curl. So those they, products- They've obviously done the patent, they've created the, 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 yeah, the whole- Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah they, were, they were big export uh, um, products. But the point I'm really underlying here that because those products were made under private label, so and explain one of the that. main just, factors, just, just, just for some of our um some of our listeners just explain right. you know because we're talking about the cosmetic industry which is big business for something like yeah. a private label just give us a snapshot of exactly what that means right. so what that means is that 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 you you actually create your own brand so for example like one of the leading brands now sheer moist nine for example Right. So we don't have a, a factory, but what we, we do, uh, business partner Derek Clement, he's formulated the brand and he, 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 he has said to the manufacturer, this is how I want this brand to feel for my clients. And, and then somebody else actually makes it who has all of the, the machinery and all the standards, et cetera, et cetera, that you have to meet. And then you put your product name on there. That's your brand. And in fact, we need more of our community to do that because it's brand, it's it's brands that drive the economy. And and ownership there we, as well, isn't it? Innovation. And it's about it's about ownership, it's about innovation, it's about utilizing the means of community uh, communication. One of the challenges that our community has at the moment is that we're not using digital in, innovation and digital tools to collaborate create create back brands that go across sectors and that's what we did back in those days so what we did successfully was link fashion music hair products shops as one ecosystem of collaborative businesses lifestyle it's a whole lifestyle absolutely because the magazine so if you think of root magazine yeah. root magazine best actually symbolizes that and then say West Indian world, Caribbean times, symbolize the, the news and that more deeper content, which gave you the social, cultural, economic context of the time. So what you've just explained to me is more than innovation, you know, it's innovation, aspiration and everything else, but it's a shared experience because we don't have one person building this we have a team and i think it, it, the team building is something we don't give ourselves i think in our community enough credit about because the team building is really important but i wanted to ask you rudy across the pond when dyke and dryden had an opportunity to work with a major manufacturer in the usa was that a black business as well yeah and that's a great question and the answer is yes and that really came about in 1982. So Dyke and Dryden organized the first ever trade mission from this country of black businesses. Amazing. And there's about 40, 40 businesses who are manufacturers, retailers, 40. hairdressers. About 40 of us left here July 1982 and went to Atlanta to the Bronner Brothers show. And the reason was that Mr. Dyke said that in order for us as black business people in this sector to be taken seriously, we needed to have our own show, uh, a home man, our own show that had the manufacturers and the retailers, the wholesalers, the hairdressers. And also from my perspective as a sales and marketing manager, it was also a tool to control our brands and to compete against the other brands as well by, by creating our own showcase. And, um, and that's where we learned the, about how you link music, fashion, promotion, all in one tight arena. It's from the, the Bronner Brothers show. So when I came back here and um, came up with the, the line, uh, the, the title Afro Hair and Beauty. So that that wow. model of that 
layout is it was just what I learned from watching the the experts in um, in Atlanta. And so M&M products was really, again, an integral part, then later soft sheen products. So M&M were from Atlanta, from Atlanta, soft sheen were from Chicago. So they, in, the, in those early days, they were pivotal in terms of being able to generate that high level of income that could be then driven for promotions, employ people, because obviously Dyke and Dryden had shops had over yeah. 50 staff warehouses and things like that and um it was an integral part of of the of the industry that's amazing so they're market leaders um, not only in yeah. the, the uk but they're obviously making uh, their way through collaboration in the us yeah. and they're supporting yeah. black businesses in the uk yes. trade credit right. also yeah. building up skill sets with people, they're collaborating, they're cooperating, yeah. they're expanding, they're doing all of that. So when and we the, think the about thing, their contribution, can I, can I add something to how that many people before you Yeah, can Sorry, I add you? something before you can I just add something before you go on to the next point, Sonia? Yeah, of course you, you raise can. a good point because um I mentioned about the importance of hairdressers and professional hair, hairdressing and the skills that many young people, thousands of young people learn. So you're talking about at the top of that was uh, Winston Isaac Splinters. So they were in fact uh, Dyke and Dryer's largest customer in terms of hairdressing. And salon, I think you need to let our customers store. know where where Splinters was. Yeah. You know, you got to you got to in, the location of the shop Maddox, and all that because that is yeah. very important. Maddox Street in Mayfair again to have a salon of that size from our community. Winston came from Guyana. He, again, he trained thousands of people. Uh, Derek Clement was the first, uh, one of the first artistic directors, one of the first protégés out of that. But also, of course, in North London, we had Joan Sam, Supreme Hairdressing. Yes. Which again, were very closely with the Dyke and Dryden, Dryden family. And was also on West Green Road. Again, absolutely on West Green Road and Turnpike Lane as well, where they had a school really important because they turned out you know lots of lots of young people which uh, it's an integral part and the other important thing in terms of the of the day as well there was a body called the caribbean and afro society of hairdressers so dyke and dryden arranged for their first meeting to be held in their warehouse at st Louis road off of seven sisters road so again they understood that collaboration is important and that's why I still use that word collaboration is great or three words right up to today because again they they help to galvanize the industry and the community the culture and 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 express those values of collaboration Mr Dryden always used to say to us we're only here planting seeds that's what he used to say all the time we're okay. just planting seeds yeah. So really, let me ask you a question. Now. Let me take you back to the early 80s or jet setting about. Give me a snapshot of what your day consisted of. So you get up, you're going into work. What? Tell me, just give me an idea of your day. Oh, I really those, would like to those, know. In those days, I had hair, right? <laughs> I've <First> seen you. <laughs> You've never seen me in real life with hair, but I did have hair. hair. And funny enough, okay. my hair used to be be natu natural, just sort of pretty close crop, natural, used to keep it low, because I used to, you know, that was my style. But then somebody said to me, in fact, one of the American guys said to me, said, Rudy Page, you're selling curly perms, and you need to have a curly perm, man. <laughs> <laughs> so you see that? There you go. That, yeah, yeah, that's, so that's the only reason why I had a curly perm, because... Okay, thank you for that, Joseph, product. that's brilliant. But, um, Tell me your day. Point, Come on, tell me what your day looks like. I'm fascinated. Right. So if, if show my commitment in terms of Dyke and Dryden. So in those days, I lived in Reading. So I regard myself as a Slough man. So lots of my family and friends from that growing up, they will know me from Slough. They know me as a Slough man. I, I moved to Reading and I used to drive from Reading to Tottenham every day and back. And in those days, Sonia, I had to be on the motorway at quarter to six in the morning 
in order to get to Dyke and Dryden for nine o'clock. And I, I would always be one of the first people to arrive. So when Mr. Dyke came to open up, I would be there sitting in the car waiting for them. And he always recognised that in me, that I, I, I actually, you know, would get there in time for work, even though I lived so far away. And it was in those days from Reading was a difficult journey. So in terms of, <clears throat> so I would have a programme and I, I would just map out which part of London I would be working in, whether I'd be working in, you know, west, south, east, whatever. And, and then I would just have a, a rotor where I'd visit retailers. And in those days as well, Dyke and Dryden held the um, Selfridges account. So I would visit Selfridges. The Selfridges account? Yeah, and that, and that was important. So in the early 80s then, we still had, um, we still had a lot of work to do in terms of distribution and getting the products into a wider market. So um, m m many people won't remember, but the, that that whole that old group of retailers called chemists, as they were called then, they they dominated the retail sales because the what were called drug stores uh, couldn't really sell the, those products until the law was changed that allowed oh. them to actually sell more. So there was a tight control. So there was a tight control on the whole set who wholesale the products. And then of course there was a tight control on ter in terms of the retail. <laughs> and then with Mr. Wade, I, I uh, or supported Mr. Wade in those days, given that he, he was the director, company secretary, and I was the sales manager to, to get the products into boots. And, boots and at the, the time that was a major, that was a major thing. And I, in fact, I remember in some of the one of the negotiations, I missed the I missed that particular meeting, where Boots kind of said, "Oh, you know, you can you can have you can have I think 50, 15 stores in London, but you you have to deliver the products to each store yourselves, and then you know you're you 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 go into the stores and speak to the managers and tell them about the products," and I. And I remember saying to Mr. Way that, that that's strange that we, you know, why, why should we be having to deliver to um, each of the um, stores individually? So the next meeting we went to and when everything was finalized, we were just leaving. And as we were walking out the door, I turned around to the, to the management team and I said, well, why can't we deliver to the central warehouse in Nottingham <coughs> like everybody else? And then one of the senior managers says, oh, we don't see why not. That's that's OK. And with that, that actually boosted up the size of the order, because once you're delivering to the, ce the central warehouse, you're talking about pallets of products. Yes. Whereas if you're delivering to individual stores, as you can imagine, they've only your got handbag. Yeah. It, exactly. So that 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 really um, gave a boost and uh, to, to to the business in terms of the perception of the products in the mainstream because again as as people were becoming more affluent and aware people didn't like not everybody wanted to go to brixton market or shepherd's bush market to buy their products or Ridley road. People want to, yeah <coughs> Ridley road. um so again in order to drive the sales up and and of course this is where it becomes a double-edged sword because once you start to drive the wider retail market and as i mentioned about the drug stores you then have that reduces the sales within the very same community from which you you come from as well in terms of the the competitiveness so for a while it didn't right. matter but there's a point where you get to a kind of market saturation and, yes. and then of course it's about price then and buying power yes and, 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 that, and, and that's obviously just, it would then have to be You'd have to then consider new lines. You know, like you said, it, your it, price point will change. You know, you're going to be looking for new areas for distribution um, and you're going to be looking for new product lines as well, aren't you? Yeah, no, absolutely. And at a time where things are getting extremely competitive, lots of sales reps around by that time. And, and I'd left Dyke and Dryden by 1984, was doing my own thing for the next few years as well. 
so there was a lot of changes uh, later on, especially near really the good. late eighties and um, early nineties. <clears throat> sorry. So, really, let's talk about. I mean, listen, listeners, if you're there, watch viewers, you can log on to Facebook AAL TV and you can post the question. Talk to us about black business. We want to hear about in the black. We want to hear about your business if you're from a magazine. Anything to do with lifestyle, what Rudy Page has just been describing. We want to hear your story, especially if you had a brand in the 80s and the 90s. We want to have a little bit of reminiscing for this day. For computer, computer, really. So, Rudy, I wanted to ask you, you know, you've just really given us a fantastic background. You know, you've more than a snapshot of what things were like. And we can see that obviously these individuals were dedicated to doing business within their community. So... What does the black pound look like for you now, as in when well, we're talking about black business? What, what, what's, what do you think? What, the reality? Well, yeah. The reality is that um, we're getting a lot of announcements, I've noticed, and, and a lot of um, social media posts. But... I would like to see some real substance personally to 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 those uh, to those posts. So ev evidence that there is that level of collaboration, there is a commitment to you know training young people, and that the uh, that we're promoting brands that we create, that we're using them, and that we're using sales channels that that involve our communities. So. There's no reason why we can't be buyers and sellers to ourselves of products and services. And, um, and then most importantly, there are plans in place for training the next generation. And all those things uh, we, we do within our business network. Uh, so that's what I would like to see and hear more of and see the evidence of. But how, but how would we evidence that? Because... Here you have three individuals come, you know, came to the UK from the wind rush. Probably a lot of them didn't come from, you know, brilliant means and monetary, yeah, but obviously they humble origins. All... They were all came from humble origins. Yeah, absolutely. Right, they all came from humble origins. Exactly right. Um, they came from humble, but they had a desire, the will, and decided to collaborate to make something, you know, magnificent. You know, not only making money. You know talking about employing people, you're talking about training people, and you've already mentioned the knock-on effect with that, where that means individuals in the community don't have to worry about looking for a job as such because somebody can offer you some form of employment. Now, right exactly. now, we have a situation yeah. in the community where there's still people, we're still having to knock on doors to get a job. You know, yeah, still have to yeah, knock absolutely. on training, still have to knock on a bit harder on to, to, to get support from you know lenders and i'm just wondering yeah. whether or not in some ways not that we've gone backwards but we don't seem to have moved very far, very much further right that's a really good point sonia and 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 this is the conundrum that we face here in the uk right so first of all when dyken dryden first uh, hit a million pound turnover what year was that get, you know, so th I was still there at the time, so that would have been some time up to 1984 when I My left And at the time, yes. with a million That's pound incredible. turnover, so you can imagine how much a million pounds would be worth now. Um, but they were not able to get an overdraft from the bank for five thousand pounds because they were still and considered they a, ring. a million pounds. Yeah, so that that tells you the pressure that would that um that our community was un under and i can tell you a side story to that that um in my days with business link in this would be in around 2000 the bank of england published a report around the the financing of african caribbean businesses and i remember it i can remember the name of the author but i won't say his name but all i will say is that um in the report, it said that there's a perception of discrimination when it comes to finance for, or financing of African Caribbean businesses. Because obviously in those days, 
um, the generations of black businesses were primarily African Caribbean people, as opposed to now where you have a mix of African though and you know and Caribbean. But and so and at a business link meeting, um, I challenged him and said, actually, and I told the story of Dyke and Dryden. So I was able to say, well, you know, a few years ago from now, so that would have been two th the year 2000. So 1984 was still clear in my mind in terms of what we did in those days. And I told the story about Dyke and Dryden. And then he had to admit that, oh, well, he said, yeah, we, we, we just put this report together. And that led to the British Bankers Association at the time, who had a member of staff there to initiate a, a, a program, a research program, as it related to um, the financing of African Caribbean businesses, what was actually going on. I mean, they did do, they did, the report was okay, but it wasn't great because institutionally, there's still kind of a reluctance to really be very clear that having suffered from discrimination over a period of time, then what then should be put in place is a real clear business support program financing, you know, with fair financing. But you you got some of that with um, Business Link <clears throat> under a program, and you might remember Access to Finance. Yes, and I that's do remember where Access you to Finance. Advisor, and if you had the business advisor, advisor and support, they could go to the bank with you and you would, you know, get I actually did use support. that service. Yeah, you, you had North London Business Development Agency, which Mr. Wade was one of the founders of, and, and they were good. So there were some interventions, but of course, those interventions don't last long. It's never quite enough. And of course, at the end of the day, the way the way the market works, the market is a very competitive place. So, and at different points, you, you need assistance. Doesn't matter who you are, who you are, or how good are you are, how good you are as an entrepreneur, because you can be a great with 10 people to 100 people. But what, but what happens if you're 100 and you need two or 300 people? The That's kind right. of support you need. Or you're one and you need two. Absolutely. Yeah, and it, so it doesn't exist. That's that's the re, that's the reality, and and um, I, I've yet to be convinced and. If it's out there and I haven't seen it, it would be great for people to come and show us in public so that they can get the recognition and explain to her, us how they have got over those barriers. Yeah, and I think that you, you really raise an interesting point. And I think at this point, I would really like to honour Basil Lewis, <coughs> who sadly yeah. passed away here, who yeah, yeah. came a as the same same sort of generation, I'm sure, as uh, yep. Mr. Way. They're like good Mr. friends. Mr. Uh, Basil Lewis, Mr. Lewis, and Mr. Way lived on the same street in Jamaica, so I met him a number of times. Okay. And they they tell you great tell you great stories, you know, from Turnpike Lane and the kind of things they had to do, and what they went through as well, structurally. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I think we have to give credit because obviously Basil Lewis, with some other individuals, was the founder of the credit re the credit union movement, yeah. the UK, yeah. and he's actually honoured for that to this day. So prior to yeah. that, Britain did not have they had mutual companies, but they never really had yeah. a credit union, which is something that is more synonymous with the Caribbean and even Africa. So Absolutely. where it comes to trying to get money, financial support, there we have someone who set up something because they know the need was there for the community. So yeah. what and are also, we... And I was going to so add to as that. A community, Sorry. As a community, yeah. Rudy, what, 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 what do we need to do right now? Because we know right. we have COVID-19. Okay. I don't think we can ignore that. All businesses, all businesses um, have some sort of financial trouble if they haven't got some financial trouble they can't operate because of covid you know they've been interrupted business has been interrupted but what yeah. benefit can that be to black businesses and i say that because um an opening program we recently did an interview with um, a black business 
literally, I think next door to where Dyke and Dryden business started originally, the Tree of Eternal Life, where somebody has opened a new business right smack bang in the middle of lockdown. So you still have individuals, entrepreneurs, still doing positive things. But what can we do on, on a systematic um, operation? What can we do in the community to really get business, employment, training going? Yeah, there's a few points in there, Sonia. Just going slightly back on what you were saying about Basil Lewis and that generation is that they were willing to collaborate and pull pull their resources, either through cooperative working or, as you said, the credit union. I mean, in modern Partner. day, and of course, they had partners as well, which was a significant finance of housing and businesses, houses and businesses. But in this modern day, we talk about um, pooling resources and sharing revenues. But you, there's not a lot of individuals who who will do that, but um, so I see that as one of the areas to for us to be thinking about is to collaborate within ourselves. And I touched on earlier on that we must make products and services and use them ourselves, sell them and train the next generation. You know, it's as simple as that. Really, it's not it's not any rocket science. So, so some of it is definitely about behavior change within ourselves as well. And um, so th there's, there's, there's nothing really new to be said other than to build collaboration, trust and confidence within ourselves. And your point about COVID is so true as well, that if you think about what COVID has done, it, it, it has un it, first of all, it uncovered fragmentation in terms of collaboration or collaborative leadership, the management of systems or lack of systems, it, it uncovered that. It, it, it also has created minutes. a market opportunity. Okay. Four minutes. Okay. It created, it created opportunity in the, it, it closed down a lot of the retail or most of the retail operations, which meant that those of us who put our products and services online now yes. had a, a great opportunity to reach the consumer, yeah. i.e. ourselves. So some of our brands have benefited from that. Many brands have benefited from being online. And obviously we know the household names. I don't need to mention them. So yes. um, the, the use of technology and digital tools are important. The whole That's diaspora right. movement. So we need entrepreneurs now to be more outward looking and uh, think of international trade and then in our local communities and neighborhoods there's still a demand for services goods and services yes. products and services so we just need to create more we need more women in business definitely yes. especially that age group between 40 and 60 age group where again the evidence shows that that age group you know there's great potential for them so again lived experience and everything more. like that yeah yeah, they've lived the experience. So what we actually need then, we need uh, more business support services, which uh, we know that we don't have that kind of support in the terms of the local economy anymore. But some of that can be done through experienced business people collaborating and working with that generation of people who, who would like to get into business but don't know how. So the collaboration is, is, is a, it's, it's increasing the internal collaboration and that certainly would generate uh, um, revenue and income revenue, to be yeah. shared. And employment. Okay. Yeah, and employment and the skills that go with that. Okay, I've got a slight delay here, but um, Rudy, we're just about to come to the end. Can you believe it? It's, like, it's gone so quickly, 45 minutes oh, time's gone. Yes, I'm that afraid to part say. Two. Yeah, we're going to have to, but um, I really want to thank you because what you've done, you've given us a snapshot of something that's evidence-based. And I think yeah. why we wanted to do Black History Month is we forget, actually, that this is not nothing new to us. We have yeah. got real examples in our community that we just need to remember, you know, remember yeah. their contribution, really, and the work that you're doing and um, through making connections work is, is invaluable. But I do want to thank you for being our special guest on For You Too today, honouring and celebrating 
History Month, and we will have a part two because we want to talk more about the Black Pound, whatever that is. Yeah. How, what, how does that really work? Another thing, another thing we want to talk about, Rudy, we want to talk about employment and business enterprise. So we're Time going to do a whole out. show around. Time is out. <laughs> Time out. Bye. Okay. Thank you very much for joining us, and we will be yeah, in touch. Yeah. Uh, ask, Readers, ask Rudy, listeners. yes, I, 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 I think it would be a good idea if you ask Rudy to come back again and talk about these issues, because really what I see and what I feel in my mind, there is so much to discuss and there are so many uh, issues to troubleshoot. So you can't do it in one program. <laughs> Rudy, come you. back again, oh. man. Okay, then we'll do that. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Okay, we have you back, Rudy. Joseph, thank yeah, you very much. Viewers, thank you very much for being part of the For You Two show. Log on AIL TV, making connections work. But most important, take care and we will be in touch very soon. Bye bye. Yes. So, and sorry to cut you, like, you know, I work like a military man. So, if time is you. time, we have to. <laughs> Okay. Yes. Thank you. you. See, it policy, won't quickly. We, we need to train ourselves. We need to create our policies and follow them. Don't be no, late. No, it's just and, went, yeah. and don't go out late. <laughs> no, no, no. So, okay. as always, you have been uh, you you have been listening or watching to Sonja Kamara and Rudy Page. These guys know their stuff. If you want to know uh, anything about business and uh, and the, the good thing is that they are hiring a resident, residents. So they know everything about hiring a, yes, I must say so. Now, we, I know Sonja Kamara will, we will be back with um, another exciting another program again. So until then, um, ciao. Happy Black History Month.